Hi everyone, um, and welcome to the Strategic Agility and the Leadership in Uncertain Times uh, uh, webinar, uh, which is organized by uh, the Strategic Management and Leadership Research Cluster at the Open University Business School, uh, led by Professor George Freinas. Um, we have a great deal of um, speakers today. Um, so it's a mix of uh, speakers from academia and uh, industry. First is uh, Professor Peter Rogers from uh, Southampton uh, University. Second, uh, Dam Stella uh, Mandy, uh, Chair of uh, University Hospitals in Coventry and Warwickshire. And finally, uh, Phil Atherton, Sales Director of Enesco and uh, um, former, uh, he was uh, um, at Port Marion group. Uh, so um, I'll uh, briefly introduce myself and then uh, we move to um, Peter's presentation. So I'm Giacomo Cali. I'm a, a teaching director of the undergraduate business program uh, at the Open University um, and I'm a, uh, directing it. Uh, I've been directing it since uh, um, September. It's uh, one of the largest uh, undergraduate program in Europe for business. I'm a senior uh, lecturer in strategic management uh, at the Open University and part of uh, this research cluster. I'll move uh, quickly uh, to um, Peter's presentation, but not before telling everyone uh, again, welcome to this webinar. And uh, if you have uh, questions uh, and we kindly invite you to post questions on uh, uh, the chat box you find on the side, um, please do that during the presentation. We are going to collect them and uh, at the end of the three uh, conversation, we are going to have a, a virtual roundtable with our guests uh, on those questions. So uh, please uh, post the questions uh, as soon as you um, have them so we can basically share uh, at the end of our uh, conversation. Uh, I'll move to um, to Peter. Um, so next slide. Uh, Peter is a, a professor of strategy and international management um, at Southampton uh, Business School, uh, and uh, he directs the MBA there. Um, he has studied in Cambridge, and then he got his uh, uh, master and PhD in Birmingham and uh, is a uh, 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 famous researcher, so he published in a uh, top uh, uh, business journal, uh, just to mention a couple, Public Management Review and Journal of Business uh, Research. So uh, he's also uh, consulted at uh, government level for uh, his expertise. So um, I will handle it to you, uh, Peter, uh, to talk uh, about strategic agility. Thank you very much, uh, Giacomo. And firstly, uh, thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation from the Open University and uh, colleagues, Professor George Freinus and uh, Dr. Richard Godfrey. Um, strategic agility. I'm just for about 10 minutes going to be talking about what this concept is. Um, probably apologies at the start. Out of the three presentations, mine might be the boring one because it's academic and theoretical. <laughs> um, so Dame Stella and Phil um following me will be doing and speaking i uh, hopefully about much more interesting and relevant things about how these things what we talk about in the classroom actually come out in practice in the real bad world of, of business and life um but in terms of strategy in general as we know firms organizations certainly firms will seek to maintain and gain competitive advantage why to in the first instance um gain profits but also to stay alive in terms of business sense um, but so they're needing to find ways to stay ahead of the pack in crude circumstances. Traditional, shall we say, um, thought, academic thought in the world of strategy and strategic management looked, for example, at things like rational strategic planning. You could make a strategy on paper and then think about how we're going to then implement implement that over a period of time. And of course, that's fine if nothing else changes. However, let's just all think we're, what's, what's the date today? The 25th of November, 2020. 
think about all the places where we work and study at the Open University, Phil's business, my university in Southampton. What were our plans for 2020? You know, on the, let's say the 25th of January 2020. How has the how has the world changed over the last 10, 11 months? And how has this affected? So I think this this um, webinar today is relevant to try and kind of really realize what this means in, in practice. So strategic agility, um, this is an academic definition. Um, academics like arguing about things, so definitions are elusive, but three kind of core things that we look about is about the successful adaptation when an, uh, an environment is turbulent and is changing. There's no predictability. How do you respond to those things? Instead of sitting and doing nothing, you'll be already going backwards. So the ability to move and to be adaptive. Secondly, is the change from the difference and the routine. A business, for example, might have a way of doing things. It's incredibly routinized and because of that, it might be very, very efficient and that makes generates profits and competitive advantage. However, sometimes we need to require change and move away from that. And thirdly, and not un, un, unimportantly, is the importance of speed. Um, a company and lots of companies fail <laughs> because they might have some very good ideas for developing some strategic agility responses, agile responses, but they don't do them quick enough. You need to be able to very, very quickly sense the moment and make the change. OK, so that's the challenge and things to take into account. Changing technologies, different norms and values. What do people think about things? I've thrown down as well some ideas, different stakeholders. We might be talking about businesses in a domestic setting. The stakeholders, of course, get even more difficult if the organisation is working across international jurisdictions. So it'll be, again, a range of different stakeholders, different norms and values, maybe different governments. How do you fit all of these into your strategic responses and strategic ag agility? Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of looking at what strategic agility is, it's kind of an overarching meta capability, which is an academic bit of a academic term there. But it's not only about how we efficiently allocate our resources, but it's also how we balance these. And sometimes there might be contradictions in terms of how we allocate resources for different parts of the business business process. But again, if we see in terms of the enabling capacities, doing things quickly and redeploying and making the decisions and that feeds into I'm not I'm not going to touch on it too much, but how um, within the concept of strategic agility, leadership falls through that in terms of an incredibly powerful thing. The leaders need to be making these decisions quickly. If not, as I've put here, the rigidity trap, which is in kind of layman's terms, sitting, doing nothing, and then you'll be going backwards. You'll have inertia in terms of institutional and organisational settings. Um, next slide, please. So moving on, um, again, in the literature, there's a, there are discussions over the last couple of decades in terms of strategic management and strategy, in terms of what are the key issues when we're trying to develop strategic agility and also the concept of an ambidextrous organisation. What do we understand by ambidexterity? Two key concepts which are exploration and exploitation. Exploration is looking beyond, so looking beyond the routine, as I mentioned, doing things the same way that we've always done them and actually seizing the opportunity for new for new things. Exploitation um, at the same time could be doing things just slightly differently, so incremental innovation. So there's no need to change the world, there's no need to change the whole way you do your production, but just some slight incremental changes might make huge amounts of difference. So in terms of some examples, for example, you might think of things like, um, I don't know, mobile phone markets in the, in the mid 2000s. You could have companies famously um, Nokia and Blackberry were spending lots of time trying to pursue, you'd probably argue it as organisational agility, developing a better mobile phone. And then you see, we all know what Apple did, which is created a completely new new device. This has got, well, how is it different from Nokia? 
the Apple iPhone has got different functionality. You know, you can play your music. We all know what an iPhone does. So that multifunctionality, you could argue, is a, is a is an example of maybe strategic agility, which is looking beyond, moving beyond the routinized, and looking to see where markets might then develop. Okay, so in terms of ambidexterity and agility, that's one thing I would I would kind of like to underline is the importance, and it's criti it's critically important, but incredibly difficult to achieve, is to try and reconcile the contradictory natures of you know, how are we going to allocate these scarce resources within the firm setting? So it's it's what it's saying is it's it's quite easy, and especially if an organization is making money and being profitable, to carry on doing the routine. However, we don't know what is around the corner, and we also don't know how the organization, for example, in its makeup is ready to take on those new challenges. So, for example, going back to the uncertain times we live in today, Businesses that are going to thrive going forwards in 2021 and 2022 are businesses that will have used this time over the last nine months to, to look in onto themselves, reflect and see how they can do things, whether this is exploitation, whether just doing things slightly and tinkering things to make some incremental innovation or whether they're going to seize new new markets and new ways of doing things. Um, that's probably my 10 minutes, is it? Yes, it is. Uh, thank no you, Peter. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was uh, <laughs> an impressive presentation. I, I was uh, really, really listening to you, especially uh, about the three aspects, but making sense of things quickly, making decisions and redeploying resources. Uh, that process, uh, how many times in uh, we see in our organization and in, in other organizations, the difficulty to do this uh, as a process. So maybe sometimes we don't have any any of those components. Sometimes we have just one and the other do not flow very well after that. And also the combination of uh, exploration and exploitation, how, how we do that uh, in organization is not uh, um, always uh, very clear. Um, we will come back to that. Uh, so if any uh, of you have uh, uh, questions, please post them in the chat box. We are all collecting them. We are monitoring them, so we will collect them and uh, then we will ask uh, the questions to our speakers. I'll, um, I'll move to, uh, to Phil, so if we can. Yeah, perfect. So Phil Atherton is uh, currently uh, sales director uh, at Enesco, uh, uh, which is a gift business uh, uh, company with uh, uh, 200 million uh, turnover all around the world. Uh, but previously, uh, he worked for uh, uh, Port Marion Group as a group sales and marketing director. So probably since he moved uh, recently to Enesco, his um, conversation today with us will be about his experience uh, at Port Marion. Um, for him and uh, for uh, our other industry speakers, Stella, we have the same set of questions. The first one is uh, about uh, um, the changes that uh, organization, uh, any organization has to uh, engage in this pandemic. So uh, the question is what major strategic and operational changes uh, did the organization uh, engage in either before or during uh, the pandemic, uh, Phil? Thank you, Giacomo. Um, and can I just say, Peter, your presentation set the scene perfectly um, for what I'm about to talk about. Um, so really, we as a business were already transforming the organization into a digital led business from a traditional sales led business which was bricks and mortar and traditional retailers we recognized that digital was becoming more important we did start this pre-covid um, at what we thought was pace but as soon as covid hit obviously the retail stores around the world closed and we had to then move at warp speed to really make them digital changes to help the business one survive but two, to continue bringing cash flow into the business 
from making sales, being able to pay wages, being able to pay warehouse, rents, et cetera, et cetera, all our overheads. So very quickly, we made a number of structural changes. Um, we also made process changes to the way that we do things, the way we bring things to market. We upped our resources in all digital areas um, and we repositioned the organisation from what was traditionally a business to business organisation to a business to consumer organisation whilst those stores were closed. Within that, we saw a huge cultural shift across the business um, because people recognised that unless we did that, we would not have been here um, in a year or two years. So suddenly some of the issues that, that came out of this were things like our warehouse. So if you can imagine, the warehouse operation was used to dealing with big retailers like John Lewis, for example, or some of the supermarkets. Um, and they were dealing with large orders, put into containers, all on pallets, very simple to do, um, very efficient. And suddenly, as we move to the digital transformation business to consumer model, suddenly we started to get huge numbers of very small orders that were delivered to people's home addresses. So you can imagine we were stuck between a rock and a hard place because our sales had dropped by 30%, but our activity in the business had gone up by about 40%. So the dynamics were putting a lot of pressure um, right across the organization from the sales team to the finance team, trying to manage all of the cash flow to the warehouse teams, to the operational teams. So we had to then start revisiting the processes very quickly. Um, and the structural changes and cost savings that we identified as part of the transition um, are currently being actioned and were being actioned whilst I was at Port Merion. Um, and obviously we had significant recruitment needs because the skills we required in the business were very different. So there was a lot of recruitment that we had to do to bring in those digital people to. So hopefully that gives a, a, an outline of what we did with digital transformation. It uh, definitely does. Uh, and um, what do you think uh, in terms of uh, agility uh, your organization uh, um, has done? So um, as uh, your current organization, uh, I mean your current here, you are free to speak <laughs> of uh, Port Marion. I think it would yes. be easier for you. Uh, been agile for a long time or have the changes driven uh, the agility of your organization? So, um, and that, as they allow you to become more agile as an organization. Okay, so <clears throat> again, we were starting to become more agile as a business because we're in a very traditional industry, which is gift and ceramic. And if you think about ceramic and particularly pottery, the process hasn't really changed for thousands of years because people take mud out of the ground and they bake it. OK, the process has changed, but the actual way that pottery is made is still the very similar process. So as a business, we were a very traditional business moving towards gift more. So that agility had started to come in, but relatively slowly and not as quick as we as leaders would have liked in the business. So what we were doing is starting to change the approach that we have with our customers and marketing our goods. Um, however, I would have said that before the pandemic, we were moving at snail's pace. Um, and I think what's definitely happened is the difficult changes have been much easier to facilitate and we don't have that treacle of the organisation that would have been there before. So. Actually, the culture change that we've had during the pandemic where people have had to work from home and we've sent everybody in our offices to work from home has meant that none of the silos that we had in different functions, none of the politics, none of the meeting at the water cooler and having a chat and complaining about some particular initiative, they've all disappeared and people working from home also realise that our need to survive has created a new way of thinking and doing things, which I genuinely do not believe would have happened if we had not have had the pandemic and we had not have made people work from home. Um, we really have very few barriers now to making change because people are remotely based. As long as we involve them 
and we make sure they're aware of the vision that we had and where we wanted to be and we showed them that that was a better place than where we are suddenly we got that agility very very quickly um, and we reduced all of the friction that we used to have in the organization by having people not in the office and i believe that the culture change that we've seen over the last nine months in the organization and the speed of agility would genuinely have taken us about five years as it had it not been for the circumstances we found ourselves in. So it really has helped the company become more agile. It's uh, it's impressive to see how uh, basically the theoretical points of Peter's presentation find uh, application in what you say. Basically, it's uh, really surprising. It's like uh, uh, the, there is an agreement, whereas there was not <laughs> to, to match uh, what our speakers uh, are saying. So basically, uh, everyone can see how uh, what Phil is saying now exemplify perfectly what Peter has said before. Uh, I have a final question uh, for now for you, um, Phil. Uh, an advice. Uh, you may want to give to organization and leaders on how to become uh, more agile. Uh, so what, what would be your suggestions to organization and uh, to an organization or to their leaders? Uh -huh. OK, so, so I, I call this uh, the Super 7. Um, number one is about empowering your teams. So this has been done inadvertently during this situation because we sent everybody home, so people became empowered. Um, and it's about giving people the space to make the changes that they need to make. And that really helped, whereas before there was a culture in the organisation of checking up the line and that really slowed down the agility and decision making in the business. Number two is about finding real commercial and emotional reasons why the change is required. So, for example, our real commercial and emotional reasons were we would not have a business if we did not deal in a business to consumer sense rather than a business to business sense. Um, and it was fortuitous in a way, but difficult in another way, that the traditional stores closed down because the business, like I say, could have disappeared if we hadn't made that transition. So everybody bought into the fact that we had to do the changes that we needed and be agile. Um, and we found that communication, communication, communication was key in making sure people understood this. Thirdly, I believe less is more and I mean that in terms of management levels in the organisation and having different authority levels. So in the past, for example, if somebody wanted to make a certain change that affected a commercial reason, that may have had to come right up to the board for us to uh, say yes or no. What we did is pushed all that autonomy down into the organisation um, and we found that if you've got some really good people in the business, you can almost make them like little SWAT teams who can help instigate all of those different levels of autonomy. Um, fourthly, it's about resourcing up once you arrive at where you want to be, because it's very easy unless you resource up and give the initiative, the attention it requires and the focus it requires to slip back into the old ways of working. So you do really have to make sure that when you've got to where you want to be, you, you put the resources into the organisation. Um, Fifth is find and support real change agents in the business. These people might be at a lower level in the organisation. These people might be on the front line, but they really need to be encouraged to drive that change and really push other people to make that change. Um, point number six in my super seven is reward agility. So make sure you build your reward structures around agility. So what do I mean by that? Instead of giving people incentives to just grow sales, you might want them to grow sales in certain channels with certain customers. You might want the business to be more agile in certain areas. So you set your incentive schemes around that and people tend to drive what you set them incentives on. Number seven and final point in my super seven is about ceasing and resisting old habits that discourage agility throughout the organization. What do I mean? Question all meetings. Do they really add value? Do they help us do things quicker? Challenge all the processes. Do they slow us down? Are they pointless? Are they needed? Challenge functions. Are certain functions slowing things down? So, for example, one of the things we found is that when it came to dealing with new consumers, 
our credit control department took three or four days to to approve them. What we did is sped that up to a 12 hour process and always ask yourself, will this activity that we're looking at speed us up or slow us down? And that will help you make that decision to improve your agility. This is uh, quite an impressive list of points and uh, it depicts how experienced you are in, uh, in managing, especially in, in uh, managing change in your in organization. And I can feel that uh, uh, you went through uh, not easy times in managing uh, yes. to develop that knowledge, <laughs> which is so clear. Um, thank you, Phil, for sharing thank that you. with us. And um, I'll uh, I'll move to our next uh, uh, speaker, Stella. But before I again invite uh, our audience uh, to post questions for you and for Peter uh, while they listen to uh, our conversation with Stella. Um, Stella Mandi is uh, um, a well-known um, change management and performance. Uh, uh, manager in the public sector. Uh, she currently chair uh, university hospitals in Coventry and Warwickshire, and uh, she had a former uh, posts in other public bodies. Um, and she had international uh, experience in Kenya, Mauricio, and Middle East and Morocco. Uh, I'm glad you're here, Stella. And uh, again, I, I go through the same question. So, the first one is uh, about uh, uh, the changes uh, from a strategic point of view and uh, from an operational point of view uh, that your organization engaged either before or uh, during the pandemic. So if you can talk uh, about them. So welcome Stella and I give the ground to you. We will need to switch to Stella. Sorry, I thought I was being automatically unmuted, but I've done it myself now. Um, that's great. Um, first of all, um, a little bit of context. Um, University Hospitals Coventry and Warwickshire is uh, two hospitals, a very uh, big modern PFI hospital, University Hospital in Coventry, and a smaller, more traditional hospital, Rugby St Cross. Um, and the context for us uh, is a, a little bit different, interestingly, um, from uh, uh, Peter's, ex sorry, Phil's experience. Um, in, in essence, our trust had been um, working for some years um, with the Virginia Mason Institute and in conjunct, which is a, uh, a public service improvement health institution in North America um, and with a number of other health bodies uh, in, in the UK, including uh, Leeds and Barking, Havering and uh, Dagenham, um, on looking at improvement programmes. And we have a programme which is UHCWI, an improvement program which has been taking place for, for some years and here's where I need to name check um, our chief executive Andy Hardy with whom I've had extensive discussions in preparing for today's session because the improvement program that we were doing prior to the to the pandemic um, actually resulted in a number of different um, strategic and structural changes within the trust with a reduction in the number of clinical groups, the different groups that deal with different specialisms within the hospital. Um, we've employed a chief quality officer, which is not necessarily a post that you often have within health structures. And there had been a whole range of different types of partnership working. And as all of you will appreciate who follow the media, um, working in the health sector, you are constantly having to adapt to different governmental changes and contexts um, that arrive from various points, whether it's the regional arm of the NHS or the Department of Health or, or whatever, it, whatever it happens to be. Part of that improvement programme actually involved some agile working in the sense of having uh, a, a sort of adapted lean process with Kaizen processes with multidisciplinary teams looking in depth um, 
inch wide, mile deep processes looking at, uh, with great scrutiny at individual parts of the process uh, within the hospital trust. Now, uh, our chief executive, Andy Hardy and myself, have theorised that perhaps some of this work that was going on prior to the COVID, to, to COVID-19, might have actually laid some of the foundations for the way in which we've had to react during the pandemic process. Because of course, as of February, um, everything has been um, full on and at a much greater level of pressure. Clearly running any acute tertiary hospital is a pretty pressurised environment in normal circumstances. But of course, that has been ratcheted up um, several, several times over in a pandemic situation. Now, examples of some of the ways in which we have adapted um, in that pandemic situation, drawing on agile principles that, that Peter was talking about earlier, have included things like the normal gold, silver, bronze emergency processes that large public organisations and private organisations set up in an emergency. We have very much focused on trying to make sure that we are empowering people as far down the organisation as we can within those processes, perhaps in a different way than we might have done in the past to make sure that the people we've got who are actually as close to the front line as possible can are the people who are actually giving advice to the gold level of that who are the very senior people in the organization and i think that has made a big difference to the way in which we we've, we've run it but of course there are multiple examples of that kind of agility that we've we've had to look for as you will appreciate, um, we've had to redeploy. It's interesting, Phil mentioned um, redeployment and regrouping and re-resourcing. We have been doing that big time, as you can imagine. Some of you may have been following some of this in the Guardian newspaper, which has covered some of what UHCW has done. And to give you an example, there was a lovely little cameo covered in The Guardian of a healthcare assistant who had been moved to work in intensive care, given appropriate training to do that when she had Stella, you went on uh, mute, uh, or at least it's muted for me. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> okay. I, I don't know what happened there. Um, but, uh, but we used that cameo of the healthcare assistant. Uh, you know, she, she basically was saying she'd been very apprehensive, but her experience had transformed her approach and she now felt part of the team. And there are multiple examples of that. I'll give you another example where um, a guy whose normal role is a senior role in our strategy team, and you can imagine the sorts of things that is dealing with, within the early stages of the pandemic, where there, when there were some challenges uh, about PPE and so on, uh, but a lot of local, local and regional businesses um, came, came to our aid, that strategy manager found himself in discussion with Jaguar Land Rover, uh, who were producing visors, Aston Martin, who were producing gowns, Lear Jets, who were producing ventilators, and negotiating issues with them, which would never normally have been part of his role. But that nimbleness that Peter referred to, and the ability to be agility has meant that people have, have had to adapt. And of course, I'd also draw attention to, uh, before handing back to, to you, Giacomo, draw attention to the fact that even within the last nine months, the strategic changes that we have had to respond to have changed all the time. So the first phase of the pandemic, there was very much a standing down of day-to-day -day operations and other day-to-day -day work. So that entailed a certain set of changes. Then we had kind of the break between that and the second phase when we were seeking to restore services. Now we've got the second phase of the pandemic where we are responding to people with COVID. We are seeking to keep going with our 
elective work, the day to day work, surgery within the hospital as far as we possibly can. And of course, now we almost have a, a third strategic change where we will be engaged in the massive exercise of vaccination as that comes through the door. So the adaptation that has had to take place and the retasking, you know, the, the making sure we've got people at the right level and understanding how it all feeds through to the front door has been absolutely vital in responding to those changes. That uh, is really great, Stella. Thank you for sharing all this uh, broad picture of uh, uh, the work at hospitals, which is so um, under scrutiny also now from the press and uh, I can feel all the pressure you went through uh, during this month. It's incredible and um, I think you gave us a, a very clear uh, picture of how basically hospitals, which are not typic the typical example of agility in terms of organization, can become really agile uh, under pressure. But we can also see where uh, uh, that was uh, uh, possible in the sense that uh, the resources were deployable, so were there, they were just uh, changed into their use. Uh, so um, suggest, I, I will move to the last questions uh, because uh, you, you covered <coughs> a, a very clear picture, in my opinion, on um, the changes you went through. Uh, so I will move to the suggestions for organizations and leaders. So uh, what, especially because you have a, a, a first-hand experience in uh, basically um, the epicenter of the crisis hospitals, uh, what would you uh, suggest to leaders and to organizations to deal with uh, uh, this and to become more agile? I think I'd highlight three things and here I have to pay tribute um, to the role of the chief officer team wi within the trust. So people like the chief executive, the chief medical officer, the chief nursing officer, but also the support people behind that, like finance, strategy, HR, HR in particular, as you can imagine, a massive role in terms of, you know, deployment, redeployment um, and, and all of those things. The three things I draw attention to is the, the first one, which is very much a principle um, of agility, is learning as you go and adapt because clearly as one is making all those changes in quite a new situation you don't necessarily get everything absolutely right first time you you do it and then you you get feedback and then you learn from people and if you're a, and if you're a key leader either in the public or the private sector the more um, that you can learn from those who are experiencing right down the line and exercise that humility, which means that you don't necessarily know all the answers. I think that is critical. So that learning as you go and adaptation would be one thing. The second thing, which is very important in, in the world we are operating in, the health and health and social care sector, is that it isn't all about your own organisation. It is also about your partnership with stakeholders. So, for example, in the same way as perhaps in the private sector, you've got to have partnerships with your supply chains, you know, and your distribution and all of those kinds of things. Within within our sector, if you take as an example, we work closely with other acute hospitals within our network. We work closely with Coventry City Council and Warwickshire County Council who are deploying social care. So what you can't do is be a fortress within your own organisation. You have to be working with your other stakeholders and partners. So it's not just an inward looking exercise. Agility is also an outward looking exercise and, and working all together. And then the final one, which I know Phil also, also touched on, um, which none of us obviously can underestimate, is communication. And here in the kind of world we're in, with a very high emotional content, clearly within the day to day work that people are doing, whether they're porters or cleaners or healthcare assistants or consultants, nurses, whoever they may be, the way in which the senior team have engaged 
um, face to face in both hospitals doing frontline Q&A sessions approximately twice a week with different combinations of chief officers where anybody can come along. We've encouraged people, even if they're dealing with COVID issues, to be able to release people on a cyclic basis to come to these sessions so that those people who are absorbed in a very emotional, a very draining, you know, a very intensive task could see their leaders visually, either digitally or in person and engage with them. And I think if you're going to get the agility, then you have to be trying to develop that trust and transparency at the same time. That's fantastic. I, <laughs> I have taken also notes while you were speaking, and I think this is very informative for our uh, large community of students and uh, alumni. Uh, all of them, the majority of our students are currently working, so we are a part-time institution. So uh, basically uh, these insights uh, will inform also their practice at different levels. I uh, would like to reconnect uh, to you, Stella, and to Phil for uh, um, a first question uh, we got from the audience, uh, so I'll move to the Q&A session. Um, the first question is uh, regarding the level of decision making. So uh, strategy is often often decided at the highest level of an organization where they deploy strategic plans or they design a vision or a mission or uh, they discuss what the objective should be. Uh, what can you do if you are uh, a middle level manager, a leader who wants to bring agility into the organization, but uh, it's not supported uh, by the top manager? Hmm. I'll, I'll, um, if you agree, I will start maybe with you, Stella, and then I go to Phil. Yeah. Um, I mean, clearly in any organization, you have to identify, if you were a middle manager in that situation, first of all, identify what you can do within your own remit of authority. Because there is masses of research that demonstrates that the person that um, staff most listen to and most want to hear from is their direct line manager. It doesn't matter what business they're in, that's who they most want to hear from. So actually, even within your own remit, I would argue you can be very influential in terms of trying to bring a culture of agile working. If it's about spreading it to the rest of the organisation, clearly then you have to use whatever channels you've got available. Uh, if the person immediately above you isn't that friendly to it. Maybe you can try a bit laterally. Can you talk to finance? Can you talk to HR? Can you seek alliances with other managers at your own levels? Can you find ways of using a case study, perhaps in your own area, to present to other people within the organisation through whatever channels you've got to kind of uh, almost spread the word, if you like? Um, clearly, you have to find whatever channels fit your org organization. But as a middle manager, I wouldn't underestimate your own power. Yeah, I I would uh, uh, support that uh, vast little to about the ability of middle managers to influence the course of action in an organization. Phil, what do you think about the possibility for uh, uh, a manager who is not a top manager? Uh, to impress agility in, in their organization. Well, I think Stella made a really, some really good points there. I completely agree with everything you said, Stella, because I firmly believe that as a middle manager, if you really want to create an environment for the team to be agile, you can do that for your own team and actually breaking down those barriers and talking to all of the other functions in a business. Um, will highlight you anyway as a middle manager with somebody future leadership potential. Uh, leaders in a business are not always the people at the top. There's a lot of leaders who are throughout the organisation at lower levels who are natural leaders, but they just haven't had the experience yet to get to the senior level. And I think trying to create that agility at 
team, function, peer level will highlight you as a potential future leader. So I, I personally would encourage that. And uh, in any organisation I've led, if I've seen that in the team that I run, then I recognise recognize those people as high performance operators and see them as having a strong future in the organisation. So don't shy away from that opportunity is what I would say. I'll uh, I'll move back to Peter now because we have uh, from the audience a more academic question, which is uh, a typical question that we we ask to ourselves many many times: Is the concept we are talking today, strategic agility, actually new, or uh, is it something that sounds with uh, emergent strategy like what Minsberg introduced <laughs> quite a, a few de decades ago? Uh, and also, what about, uh, I mean, uh, the preparations so the prepared mind, the prepared organization? Uh, so what do you think about that? So the novelty of the concept of strategic agility and its connection with what was already there? OK, thank you very much for a good question. Yeah, um, yeah, I think if I was going to be a cynical academic, I could say you could it would probably be a very good question to put into a university exam in terms of what's the difference between emergent strategy strategic flexibility strategic agility and strategic ambidexterity three thousand words discussed <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's an example of throwing a question back but um there are similarities of course in terms of strategic agility and what henry minsberg was writing about in terms of an emergent strategy the the clear similarity and alignment is the the role of dynamism of the the dynamic nature of strategy that's there's a clear similarity so that the the emergent strategy was a response from kind of traditional strategy which emerged from i suppose military planning yes in terms of we're going to write all this down and then we're just going to implement it irrespective of the context might have changed or the world might have changed markets might have changed etc so there are similarities i think in terms of the, of the role of the of the dynamic however you could i think in terms of the kind of very theoretical minsberg when he talks about the emergent strategy issues around you know what is the mission what is the strategic objective in, of an organization are inherently not fixed yeah so i think it was um i think it was richard branson ceo of virgin group talks about you know business opportunities are like buses you know they just come and go and you can kind of you kind of alluding to the fact of you know you can um work around trial and error and you could argue there's some degree of that in terms of how virgin of, of um the group have done it so there have been some huge successes then there's been things that haven't been so successful um agility strategic agility i think we'd argue is it's it is different in terms of there is still a an idea of the fixed objectives that they, they're, they're not so malleable it's more a case of the things phil and and dame stella have been talking about in terms of quickly making decisions quickly redeploying quickly regrouping being nimble and, and swift of foot in order to essentially still maintain the course to achieve your strategic objective so that's a, there's there's a there's a high degree of dynamism involved but it's but it's still based for the way i see it towards moving to a fixed kind of goal and i hope that helps it uh, it definitely uh helps uh, uh understanding and uh I, I found that really clear. So the stability of objectives, whereas uh, the process changes. And uh, on the process, we have a question that uh, I would pose to the three of you. So um, I would like to hear your, your voice on that. Uh, it's basically, again, on the meaning of uh, a strategy. When we talk about strategy, we have a strategic horizon where uh, we look forward and that we plan for for that in the future so uh we are seeing that this strategic horizon are collapsing now uh so they are uh becoming shorter and shorter during time and uh doing a strategic review doing strategic planning has become now more questionable the whole uh sense of a strategic process of planning it, it has lost part of his meaning now so 
uh, giving how long it takes to do uh, and understand the changes in the environment and then uh, decide where we go, do something about it. And uh, what is, uh, uh, and this is the actual question, is there a minimum period where which we, you need to uh, deploy even a strategic uh, uh, agile uh, plan? And or do you think uh, and the question here is a little bit uh, like uh, uh, cheeky. Do you do you simply have to take bets on the future and hope for the best? Because <laughs> we, we see that uh, in many cases, like uh, uh, we were provided with strategic scenarios that change radically from one month to another. So uh, what organizations should do? And uh, I, I do not have a set order for this question, so uh, as you are comfortable. You want me to go first, Giacomo? Sure. <clears throat> OK, so I, I think what's fundamental is understanding what your strategic objective is before you start to plan a strategy. So, so what are you trying to achieve as a business and where do you want to be in a set period of time? That could be one year, three year, five years, ten years. And I worked alongside, I was fortunate enough to work alongside McKinsey's when I was younger in my career. And how they defined a strategy was really simplistic. They said, your strategic objective, for example, would be to travel from London to Glasgow. That's your strategic objective. The strategy to get there could be around catching a bus from your home, jumping on the train at the station, getting off in Glasgow, getting a taxi to your location. And underneath that sit the, sit the tactics, which could be get this time bus, get this time train, you might have to change somewhere, etc. And that made it really clear. So what I'm saying is, I think you still need strategic objectives for a business where you want to be in the um, future period. And the strategy drops out of that. The one thing now that I think everybody's learned, and this is becoming more to the fore, is that that strategy has to be completely flexible and not set in stone. And that's why you need the agility, strategic agility in an organisation to be able to tack as much as you need to get to where you want to be. I, I... I would... I would completely agree with that. I mean, this doesn't because there is turbulence. Let's put it in that in the, that that way um, in the world at large. That doesn't mean that you don't need a strategy. You've still got a strategy. You know, if if I put it in our trust terms, we want to provide world class class health services. At the same time, we've got to provide services that work for our communities in Coventry and Warwickshire beyond. At the same time, we want to work with partners to tackle fundamental health inequalities. Now, those are all strategic objectives. Um, the way in which we achieve them is affected by some of the buffeting, but sometimes that buffeting is negative. But sometimes that buffeting is positive. For example, for a long time, we've had an objective about expanding our emergency department, which you might see as either operational or strategic. We've actually been able to bring that forward because COVID-19 has made the way in which we structure that much more imperative. And we've got some money from the government to do it, which we didn't previously have. So I think one of the issues about strategy is identifying which opportunities along the way you should take up that you didn't previously predict and which opportunities are actually the wrong opportunities that are going to take you off your strategy. So it's making the judgments about opportunities you're going to take and opportunities you should turn down. But if you think of the long term issues that are going to affect your particular business, if you look at ours, one of the long term issues that affects the world of health is technology and nearly any, every other business is affected by this. But ours is a particular kind of technology where R&D is constantly changing the technology. Just look at the development of vaccinations, for example. So so the health world, whatever the world is looking like, we've still got to adapt to that kind of that kind of technological change. So I'm absolutely with Phil. 
you n still need your strategic objectives. But I come back to the point I made previously about adaptation. You may be adapting the way you achieve them, or you may find that things come to prominence that were less in prominence. I'll give you a good example. While we as a trust are focusing on COVID-19, making sure we maintain other services, we also want to focus on tackling racial inequality. And tackling racial inequality has to be part of our framework overall. And we can't lose sight of that while we're managing COVID-19 and restoration of services. Peter, uh, I'll end a little to you. So strategic horizons that are collapsing, what, what is your view as an academic? Do we have uh, any yeah, I'd, idea I'd from the literature? <laughs> it's a really good question. I'd, I'd agree with Dame Steller and, and Phil, the examples are given are really good. It, it's certainly the maintenance, of the main, the maintaining of, crudely speaking of, you know, is if you if you don't know i think the point phil was making if you don't have a core strategic objective you know if you don't know where you're going you've you've clearly reduced the chances of you getting there yeah so that that doesn't change and in a, in a turbulent environment that becomes it's incredibly important but it's still the points we've been talking about in terms of agility the the rapid the, the redeployment of resources doing that in a very swift amount of time um underlining you know the leadership that um my two co-speakers have been talking about how you know they've been giving and empowering people in their organization which crudely from an academic perspective this is human capital so you, you you're more efficiently using that human capital to 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 attempt to achieve your strategic objectives so in terms of you know is it just kind of betting on the future it uh, in, in one respect it is, but on in the other respect is you're giving yourself, you, you're going to use as much information that's available as possible. And then, as I think Dame Stella was saying about the opportunities and the seizure of exploit, that's the exploitation and, and exploration issues. These are the ones of, you know, if you see a horse and you think, hang on a minute, this horse has just been training and it's clearly faster than all the others, is don't just talk about it don't telephone your friends in new york or moscow about it buy it and then win win the horse race you know and that's these are the winners in the yeah. in the world we're living in and whether it's in a public sector setting or within the private sector in and it's that nimbleness and swiftness that, that will come through and also using time i think it's really interesting phil's examples about and saying about Kind of reflecting when we get to the end of 2020 about oh 2020 has been a disaster well not for everybody in a business context mm -hmm. because very um agile businesses have used some of the time which is also um you know very powerful to think about their organization and how they're going to go forwards and the ones that have been managed to reflect and then put into place place processes to go forward will come out in a much brighter place Fantastic. Uh, just uh, um, basically a couple of minutes to, to close and I would like a very quick round. Uh, so to close uh, your three uh, interventions, so 30 seconds uh, each on uh, a final thought about uh, what if your organization is not so resourceful as the ones where you are. So uh, what do we say to firms that try to survive uh, so they can't have the same uh, set of resources that you have. So very quickly, 30 seconds, and then I draw my final thoughts. Uh, I'll start with um, either of you is more comfortable. Uh, Phil. So, so I, I think you don't necessarily need lots of resource to make strategic change. This is about empowering people, changing the culture, changing the way you do things. And I think giving that real clarity of thought as to how you do that in your own organisation is, is the key to being successful in the future and being able to adapt that strategy to what you see in front of you to get to your end objective. Stella? I would say um, the key to agility 
uh, is absolutely listening to your staff. It doesn't matter whether you're a small business or whether you're an organisation of 10,000 people, whatever it is, you, you need to listen to those frontline people. And I would add to that, don't get trapped into constantly looking inward look outward and look at the people that you work with in your particular landscape, whatever that is. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, um, I'll probably second uh, Phil's point about reflection on, on, on where you want to go to, as Phil was saying about the, if, you, if, if the aim is to get to Glasgow, you might want to be thinking, is, is that really where you want to go to or is, it, or is it somewhere else? You know, have a think about that and then, um, yeah, enhancing of human capital in terms of this is what's been demonstrated over the last 10 months that you've got physical capital, you've got all these other different forms, but human capital is, is essentially going to make um, successful organisations function. It's not just about the money. Thank you uh, uh, for uh, this very quick round of uh, uh, Q&A. Uh, we are at the end of our um, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, taking part to it. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, Stella, uh, Peter and Phil uh, for, for your contribution. We received a lot of questions, so um, we will find a way to try to answer all of them. Uh, probably we will have to post them. Uh, besides the videos that will be available on YouTube. Um, I would like also to thank uh, Professor Zofrinas, uh, our uh, leader of the research uh, cluster in strategy and leadership, uh, and also uh, all the teams that have uh, kindly helped us organize uh, this webinar. So um, Richard Goffrey and also uh, Louise and the team uh, of alumni engagement. Um, thank you all. Uh, I, I see here a great deal of thought and uh, this is basically one of the ability of the Open University to mix uh, theory and practice in what we do and uh, I would like uh, again uh, to thank you all, uh, our three great speakers and um, uh, look, I look forward for the next uh, uh, webinar of this series. Uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye bye. Stay healthy.